Following the Russian October Revolution of 1917 that overthrew the Russian royal family, the new Bolshevik government signed a peace treaty with Germany. The end of the Russian front during World War I presented a tremendous problem for the Allies, since it allowed Germany to shift troops and material to France. Moreover, the Bolsheviks promoted ideas hated by American and British tycoons. These commies argued that the World War did not benefit working people, and that government should focus on feeding starving citizens. The Allies hoped to ouster the popular Bolsheviks by supporting armed factions, referred to as White Russians. These were military units led by former Russian officers and funded by wealthy Russians, the United Kingdom, France, and the United States, who wanted to restore the monarchy. There was also the 50,000-man Cheslovak Legion, formed by Russian monarchs from POWs and deserters from the Austrian-Hungary army that hoped to establish their own nation after the war. Winston Churchill insisted that the United Kingdom and France intervene against the Bolsheviks. Their armies were fully employed fighting in France, so they asked the United States to furnish troops for a North Russian campaign and a Siberian campaign. In 1918, against the advice of the United States Department of War, President Woodrow Wilson agreed to send 5,000 American troops as the North Russian Expeditionary Force and 8,000 troops as the American Expeditionary Force Siberia. Canada sent 5,000 troops to Siberia and the United Kingdom 1,500. This was a small force with commanders from several nations, pictured here, but it was hoped that the appearance of Allied ground troops would harden the resolve of the losing white Russians. Japan sent troops too. It had joined World War I with the Allies, mostly because it wanted the large German colony at Tsingtao, China, which was promptly invaded. Japan had acquired territory from Russia in a short war in 1904 and probably wanted more. The Allies were uncomfortable with this help, but needed more ground troops in Siberia, so asked Japan to contribute 7,000 soldiers. Japan sent 70,000. The United States had already shipped large quantities of weapons and munitions to the Pacific port of Vladivostok, along with locomotives and rail cars, to move this material eastward to support the white Russians. But by the time the Allied forces arrived in Siberia, the white Russians and their Czech Legion allies had been routed and were fleeing eastward to Siberia. The self-anointed leader of the white Russians, former Admiral Alexander Kolchak, arrived in Vladivostok to claim American weaponry and to press his allies to fight the Bolsheviks. However, he was arrogant, cruel, and had other personality disorders. Everyone disliked him, and there was no overall Allied commander, so confusion persisted. The American and Canadian generals realized the danger and futility of engaging the Bolshevik army, especially alongside unpredictable Czech and white Russian units. As a result, the Americans and Canadians mostly remained in Vladivostok, guarding supplies and equipment from refugees and looters, and kept the railway running. Some units ventured up to 60 miles north to guard the rail line from bandits and saboteurs, but went no further after nasty scraps with roving bands of Cossacks and other criminals. In June 1919, an American camp at Rokokov was attacked at night, and 24 American soldiers were killed. American troops were lucky to have a great leader, Brigadier General William Graves. Many American generals would might use this opportunity to fight a big battle and become famous. But the situation was dangerous, and the Allied force was far from supply hubs and reinforcements. Graves knew that his two regiments could get tied down in a fight with the Bolsheviks and overrun. He resisted pressure from the white Russians, the British, and the Japanese to advance westward to fight the Bolsheviks. He wisely proclaimed neutrality and limited the American role to guard duty. By 1919, the Bolsheviks had secured most of Russia and were sending strong forces towards Siberia. The Czechs were unhappy, so the Allies shipped them home. But America's military-industrial complex was suffering with the end of the World War I, and a major war on the Soviet Union would be great for business. 
they pressured governments to continue war on the Bolsheviks. World War I had ended and all troops returned home except those in Siberia. The American public and Congress demanded that all troops return home. The Allied troops were finally withdrawn in 1920. Not every American came home since the force had suffered 189 deaths and hundreds of serious injuries. Only Japan, with their 70,000-man army, moved westward to fight the Bolsheviks. They established a Siberian protectorate in 1920, but soon abandoned the idea. No other nation recognized this annexation, especially the Bolsheviks, who kept attacking. The Siberian weather was dreadful, and the area of little value without its connection to Europe via the Trans-Siberian Railway, which the Bolsheviks had closed. The Japanese Empire was overextended and their economy suffered. As a result, in 1922, the Japanese withdrew after losing 1,400 killed in combat and another 1,700 deaths from exposure and disease. Hopes by industrialists for a new major war ended but their public relations historians rebranded this disaster as a humanitarian effort. They explained this was a good example of Allied cooperation to provide security for refugees and allow the Czechs to return home. The reality of the Siberian expedition was a desperate attempt to restore the Russian monarchy and crush the popular Bolsheviks. The Allied force was lucky to escape due to the great leadership of General William Graves. <laughs>